from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening, and thank you for coming. Uh, we're delighted tonight to be presenting Concerto Köln as the semi or penultimate event in our Bachfest series. And we're very, very pleased to have this extraordinary orchestra. Um, I wanted to say also, thanks to the orchestra, we have the pleasure of presenting them in a special workshop tomorrow morning. It was very unusual. At 11 o'clock, they're going to be talking about performance practice and the influence of Italian and French style on J.S. Bach. So um, I'd like you to welcome our executive director of the Concerto Cone, Stefan Sanger, to talk a little bit about these issues and about bowing and performance practice. Hello and good evening. Just one other, is it, the position is fine? Can you understand me? Okay, thanks very much. Yeah, um, very nice to be invited here. We're very, very thankful, it's a very special place for us. I think last time we performed here 14 years ago, which was a very special ex experience and um, we were in this time actually invited as well to visit the archive um, and see all these wonderful instruments. At that time they were based down in the cellar and it was really a special experience because it was very easy. Um, people asked, well, have a try on this violin or the other one. I was very impressed. And so this time I, I was here a little bit earlier as well, tried to arrange to get an appointment to see the fantastic collection again because I myself as well, I'm a violin player, but as well um, built violin bows or cello bows myself, especially of course in the Baroque, classical, romantical bows. And, so I took the opportunity and had the chance to see these wonderful tourt bows again, which was very inspirational, I have to say. Um, well, I don't know, I mean, if you have, s the talk I'm giving could as well focus a little bit on the instruments, but I guess you're probably very familiar with period instruments already, so I mean, if not, so um, I can as, as well include that a little bit to give you some information about that. Um, my speciality, of course, is bowing. And <laughs> It's always a chance to find a link to that. But I, um, in general, what Anne just said, the talk I'm giving tomorrow is based on the French and Italian influence in German Baroque music, which is quite a special case because um, the influence was very strong. And um, in Germany, we call it the vermischte Geschmack, the mixed taste, mixed style. I don't know how we would translate that. And um, that's basically the, well, French, Italian influence and, and how it emerged then in a very special um, way. A very good example, like when, when you look at the program, I don't know if you already have read the program for tonight. I just got it very shortly before, so I had a quick look at it. Um, and on the program, the composers are, as you've seen, first, um, well, Italian, we got Dallabaco, we got Vivaldi, Sammartini, and Bach. And um, the first, when we talk about Dallabaco, is actually quite interesting because he um, born, as the name says, like he was born in uh, Verona, very much a contemporary of Vivaldi. But then in his late 20s, he moved um, to Munich to serve at the emperor's um, court there. Um, but just when he arrived, right, immediately there was a war um, which started, actually the emperor started, like he wanted to, um, conquer the Habsburgen, um, how do you say that, a Habsburgen um, um, Reich, sorry. <laughs> anyway, you understand what I mean. He was defeated and they had to flee. The whole um, court has to flee in these times, quite luxurious. Well, it's not just like rush away, but take the whole court with himself. So Dalabaku as well has to follow, just arriving from Munich serving as a, in the South German court, they fled to the lowlands in that time. Brussels was part of the Netherlands. And a little bit later on, because fighting were going on, they had to fly, flee to, flee to France, northern part of France, and as well spent two years in Versailles. And then after 10 years, finally, they got back to Munich, where Dallabaco then 
served um, till he died in 42, I think about that. So, um, good question, is he Italian, is he German, Netherlands, France? What's the influence in his music? And um, so I, I could give you as well, I mean the piece we're playing tonight is very much as a concerto grosso, of course, and it's um, already written under that French influence, which apparently is getting stronger and stronger in his music. So we have a strict form of a concerto grosso coming from Corelli, and um, the French influence, the very simple um, way of um, seeing the influence is in the dance movements, because the French like to dance very much, especially Louis XIV. In this um, special symphony we're playing, the last symphony is a passe-pied. So when you think that's very easy, oh, that's a French influence, it's not that easy. I will quote from the German composer or even more famous music, music historian who wrote actually some interesting books on performance practice. And he has written in 39 the following. I hope I translate it correctly because well, just had the German, the German version, so I hope you understand it. So he's saying about a passe-pied, either in a symphony or for dancing. The kind of passe-pied often used in worldly symphonies gains a different character through the previous or following movements. It serves as a substitute for an allegro or fast movement. Quite often the Italians finish their symphonies with this kind of passe-pied. The French, in contrary, only use it, just use it to train their feet. <laughs> we Germans would not be hindered if we feel like dancing, although the form of the passe-pied might not be entirely correct, at least to adapt the rhythm. So, very difficult. What do we make out of that in the interpretation? Is it just for dancing? Is it don't we care about the rhythm at all? Is it just a fast movement? Or is it, yeah, the German way, um, the form is somehow a passe-pied, not correctly, but then we adapt to the rhythm. Um, to give you, so these are the, um, wow, that these are the influences, as I said, like Italian very much in the German music, to see what actually where it all comes from. I think it's quite diff um, interesting to, to see precisely what is the French character or what is the Italian character and how did it finally came to Germany. And I think it's quite interesting to look back a little bit for um, seeing what actually the fact is. So if you shift now, these days we, we've been in the symphony is written about 1715. If you go back to the year 1600, just see what the um, situation is. First of all, quite interesting. Germany, 1600, it doesn't exist. It's mainly, you can talk about the German-speaking countries, and it's a union, a compound of about at least some several hundred courts, and they might, might be like um, from size like very small, some two to three hundred up to some thousands and some independent cities. So it's just a comp lo very loose compound. Um, it's in, you can imagine probably it's difficult to say that's the taste compared to a centralized state, for example. Um, at that time, you could really say that Italy was the inspiration for art. The, if you think back from, coming back from the Renaissance, I mean the big names even from architecture, painting, or Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, or if you think about the musicians, we hear the Gabrielis, Monteverdi, 1600, um, very important, later, Corelli, Vivaldi, and of course, in general, the opera as well. So that is a very major influence in German, and all the courts were definitely that kind of exchange happened from early on, because trading already in that time, especially with Venice, was very strong in, in, in Germany, and in different courts had um, very strong links. Gabrieli has been uh, um, working for a certain time in Munich, and from that emerged um, actually that musicians early on traveled to Italy. So we had, for example, Schütz would go to study with Monteverdi, coming back then in, in serving for 50 years in Dresden, and um, we had the link from uh, uh, Pretorius, for example, in Hamburg, that kind of polychoral um, style what came from Gavirelli. So we're talking about a, very, a style of a contrapuntal style, many voices, and um, you see how that emerged later to be very, very big 
influence for John, John Sebastian Bach, basically. So that Pretorius, Reineken, Bruns, Buxtehude, um, that's the Northern German organ school, which Bach was very, very deeply influenced by, and that profoundly laid the ground. I mean, that is really, you could say, his home in a way. When he was about 20, he walked from Lüneburg, where he was based, or in Arnstadt, actually, got his first job um, as, an, as a cantor, meaning playing the organ in church. And he walked to, um, to Lübeck, that's about good 250, 300 kilometers. I don't know the equivalent in miles, but um, quite a while to walk there. And of course, he only was allowed to stay for, I don't know how many weeks, but he stayed three months longer since he had the opportunity to be there. So that is really the, the very big influence for um, Johann Sebastian Bach. And um, on the other side, like Italians being employed in Germany were always very, very highly accepted, appreciated, welcome. So and they were far higher, and they got far higher salaries than the Germans, for example. And it went up that far that, for example, in 1707 in Dresden, where there was at that time a very, very famous um, Hofkapelle, an um, orchestra. And um, there were about seven Italians in, um, engaged, and the average of them would get um, a salary of 4,500 taler, while the best paid German at that time would get 1,200. So they really knew how to market themselves. They were very highly ranked. <laughs> and um, yeah, as I said before, like Schütz being in, 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 in Venice meeting Monteverdi, that is a basis as well for the counter, um, the, the concertato style or that contrapuntic style, um, voices plus basso continuo. So you could say in a way that's a, a, very, that's a fundament of, of that time in German music. Then what happened, where's France? I mean, where does the influence really come from? And it actually happened um, through the really um, big change in that time that is the 30 years war which started to happen in 1618, lasting to 1648. And as you can imagine, that time Germany being several courts, um, it wasn't too difficult, like, oh, the basis, of course, I should mention the Thirty Years' War, probably you know that it is about Protestant from the north fighting against the Catholic from the south. And the border would very much um, be, just Bavaria would be part of the Austro-Hungarian Habsburgian part, and then the north, rest of the north in that time was um, supported by the Swede, the Danish, and the French. So the war was going on, and Germany was mainly in that time ruled by these different nations. And finally, they, um, they came to a peace, and the French um, were successful in saying, well, we want Germany to be how it is, little courts, that's better for us actually of their own interest because yeah, just having small um, cut up neighborhood is always seems to be quite handy. In a result of that, of course, the prince or ever who ruled these um, courts were very thankful to the French because, well, they could just go on like before. They were ruling their little nation and therefore after that, you could say French, France really became very, very influential because another thing then interesting happening in France at that time um, is from Louis XIII still in power, but then shifting to Louis XIV, the 14th, um, and the noblemen going to France because they were thankful and impressed by all language, manner, style, the whole thing. Um, and they came, came to um, Versailles in that time, and they were, that was very influential to them. So what, then now, if you look a bit closer, what was the situation in France at that time? Um, as I said, Louis XIV, um, you probably know very much about him, but it's completely different to Germany. I mean, here we had a centralized monarchy. We had the Sun King. It's, um, the state is myself. And the other things, he loved dancing and he needed music to dance, and as well, music always serves to demonstrate a power. And um, it was kind of a perfect match that uh, just only 10 years older, his childhood friend, you could say, 
Jean-Baptiste Jean Lully been in France and served as his court, and he provided the music, um, what he needed for dancing, and as well he provided the music, what he finally needed for to getting power, like to demonstrate all the splendor he needed. Um, you could say as well, Jean-Baptiste Lully, they matched perfectly because uh, Louis XIV was very ambitious and the so was um, highly ambitious um, Lully. And you could say, see later when I get on and a little bit in that story, I don't know. If it's getting too much detail, then <laughs> you should say, um, because it's actually quite interesting how um, that kind of power relation um, helped both people very much. Um, Lully was in, in a way like a chameleon because he was born in Italy, so he is an Italian, like as um, Jean Battista Lully. But he just swapped, named himself Jean Baptiste Lully, and he became actually the icon, style icon for French music. He perfectionated that, absolutely. Um, so, what he did, I mean, he was, as I said, like I think 10 years older. When he came in, that was 53 to the court. Um, there were already some instrumental groups which were there, and one is La Petite Bond. Maybe you have heard about that. There's um, also a period instrument group in, in Holland named after that. And that's a group which um, actually played in the chamber, in the, in the Chambre du Roi, in the chamber of the king, serving that kind of music. And the other group, very influential, is the 24 um, violins, violon, they said. So you can't translate it to, well, violins. It's misleading, as you shouldn't think of a kind of early Suzuki um, group of violins. <laughs> It's actually meaning um, the scale of the orchestra means six violins, and then it's a, the music is written in five parts, so we got six violins, and then um, a section of three violas from a little bit smaller, medium, bigger, and then, so that's, sorry, six, three, 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 six, and six violone. It's a very mid-heavy voice what we got there, quite different, to the Italian style, like where you only would have first violin, second violin, viola, basso continuo. So it's much more like an ensemble sound, what you can imagine from that. And the other interest, very interesting thing, which actually we should see as a kind of parallel with that um, development of French music, is the development of the orchestra in itself because it somehow goes together. And uh, as you can imagine, like orchestra, you can somehow define as more than one people playing per voice. And that needs a certain organization, and Lully was obsessed with that organization. And um, so what he did is, first of all, he um, has written the dance music, and then very strict rules for bowing, for example, which before doesn't, didn't really exist in that extent. So meaning um, a very famous um, thing for the 24 violins, they were famous for le premier coup d'archet, meaning they all start with one down bow. And apparently that was very impressive. I mean, today you think, well, that's the most normal thing. But at that time, you can hear quite a lot of reviews about that, that people were deeply impressed. Actually, I should, well, I'll give you later, or maybe later I have some quotes which I can give, so I should continue here. And um, so that was the organization of the orchestra. And another thing is like, um, the style of music is um, the, uh, little ornaments he added, and they all had to be played just the way Lully wanted it. If somebody tried something else, then he strictly um, would be punished probably, <laughs> I guess. Um, so we, now we had a, a stylized orchestra playing all very nicely together. Already that left a deep impression on, on people coming to um, Paris to see that in the first time. Imagine in that time the courts in Germany, they only could afford a small number of musicians. They generally had their group of trumpet players. They would, were called Stadtpfeifer, some flutes. They had to play several instruments. They would play as well a violin and a flute. And maybe at the court they had two violins and a basso continuo group. That was very much the outlay. And for special occasions they would hire some more people. But um, generally it was quite a small scale. So they were impressed. Lots of people playing with the same bowing 
very impressive, bring quick sound apparently. <laughs> and um, to even top that, a Lully then um, put the wind instruments as well to that orchestra. And at that time, the wind instrument in the French court, they were organized in called Le Curie, that means the stable. So in, in the old days, there were like some traditional instruments like the sac boot and the chom. I don't know if I pronounce these things correctly. Um, they had five, basically five dip, different groups, is, um, trumpets and, and various wind instruments. So playing for the hunt, for example, these kind of occasions, more outdoor things. Um, and in that time fitted as well the birth of the oboe, which became actually quite influenced. And in the, in the group was like um, uh, in Le Curie playing people like Philidor or Hotter. You might have heard about Hotter, for example. He is the largest flute collection. And definitely, I mean, the, they all trace back to, the, um, to these inventions. They tried out things. Finally, the oboe was in, um, established as a three-part instrument before, just in one part. Um, and what I said, like before, the Le Curie, the 35 players in, in total, it all ended up being more or less oboe players. Like, it's quite funny <laughs> when you see, like, and here's a group, and then, on, and then 12 another oboe players just to add on. Like. So a, a big noise for outdoor concerts. And um, then what finally emerged, what Lully took out of that is um, quite characteristic, is that pair of two oboes and a bassoon playing with that orchestra. And we can, can find that, for example, marks that as a first big influence in general, in, in, in music in general. I mean, because we find that till now that, that kind of um, pairs in Baroque music very much in Bach, in the C major um, uh, overture that we're going to play later, you will find they're having quite solistic um, uh, jobs to do. So that is a, we call that the kind of solo trio. So that's a very French influence coming from from Lully and um, Louis XIV at that time. Um, so we got the outlay, the organization, a little bit of the orchestra started here. So you can see that's influential very much. And that is kind of a birth of the orchestra. And Lully as well, being very strict as well, kind of conducting in a simple way. You probably know how he died, like that he stumped his uh, how you say, like uh, in that time they were conducting like with a bit big um, pose and he stumped it in his feet and got blood poisoned. <laughs> so, um, it's also a way to die. <laughs> um, and then the other very important thing, what finally we can say the French overture, I don't know if you heard about that term because it's, in a way it's a fixed term in Baroque music. How is that identified? Like a, a French overture is very much you got that stately march it's a, an, in two beaten in two in kind of grave overture, a stately march, dotted rhythm. He would add some running scales, which is, of course, even more impressive if it's performed with a large um, number of members of, in the orchestra with a high precision. And that's very influential, in, in fact. And that's what the people wanted to copy. And from noblemen from Germany coming to Versailles, seeing that coming back, they would do whatever to get an orchestra of that scale because that music demonstrates the power of the emperor in a way. And you could see like even at the court of Darmstadt, for example, he would rent out his army in order to finance his orchestra. <laughs> so um, so um, what else? I mean, it's not really that he invented, I'm sorry, to finish that. So we've got the stately march in two and then always in Lully following a fast, section in three. And of, of course, I probably like Lully would sell it as his own invention, but in fact, it came from already Monteverdi, Cavalli have done that kind of um, thing, like very strictly two and three. When we play later the Bach overture, for example, he adapted um, the slow movement. You will find the dotted rhythm, you will find some running scales, but actually composed there in four, so quite different but then completely different in the fast section. Because what Bach would do then, he is completely used the Italian concerto, and on top of that, like a German um, fugue. And the solo in that fugue, we're talking about the concerto, would play the trio, so the French trio, like the double oboes and, and the bassoon. So we can see like 
yeah, take a little bit from, from everywhere, but be still very much the same and creating um, his own style very much on top of that. Um, well, next what happened um, is, as I said, like the Germans became very um, inspired by that and musicians as well before only going um, just to Italy they finally went to France as well and there were a group called the German Lulist so very strict and they were very strictly composing in the same way meaning dance music uh, very much and they would organize the orchestras in Germany and um, two names just to name um, is Kusser or Muffat the second, Muffat being very influential because he's written a um, treatise which is uh, still, he described very precisely the bowing, like how the French would bow and how the Italians would bow. And um, that led actually to um, some confusion. I give you a, a quote um, from Muffat, was this, what he's saying, saying. It is well known that the Lulist whom the English, the Dutch, and many other already Im imitate, all observe the same way of bowing. Gentlemen returning from these lands fail to find this uniformity among our German violinists. No matter how excellent they remark upon and wonder at the difference this makes in the sound, and they frequently complain about the incorrect rhythm of the dance. So there was a lot of work to do, apparently. Um, but it's actually, we had that, um, as I said before, Italian inspiration for art. You can say, as a summarize in a way, France being the influence for the noblemen and for the court very much, because it served very much in the first time, not necessarily the, the construction of the composition, how difficult it is. It's not about contrapunct, but it's much more about, um, as I said before, manner, language, style, dancing. It serves as, um, a certain purpose. But it became, you have to say, highly so sophisticated, so it's, it's an art of itself. But then um, you had that problem, some violinist um, being employed as a, at, a, at a court, and for example, there was an Ansbach court, and at that time it was Giuseppe Torelli was in charge. And you've probably heard about Giuseppe Torelli. He is supposed to be actually the person who invented the Concerto, concerto in, in, in we had the concerto grosso with the kind of um, Ripieni and concertino groups where pr probably two violins play a solo. But Torelli is supposed to be. I mean, it's not really clear, but in, in how far that's correct. But he's supposed to be the first who've written a concerto for just a single instrument. In that case, I think very likely a trumpet concerto. Anyway. Torelli himself, a violinist, was employed in Ansbach in this, this time, we're talking about around 1700. Um, and there was a violinist in, in his orchestra who then was asked by his um, prince, well, um, Kussa is not living very far, he's in Stuttgart teaching, go to him and take some lessons because I'd like you to play as well the dance, um, the French dances in a proper style and manner. And, um, so here's what that person, I think Maya probably is his name, wrote to his um, prince. Young Kussa from Stuttgart has now proposed that rehearsals in the French style take place daily. I learned what little signs I have in playing the violin at the Viennese court from one of the foremost masters in the world and at rather high costs. Up until now, your serene highness has been content with my in insignificant person and has even requested me several times to play a solo in the presence of one or another visiting lord. But if I adopt the short French bowstroke, I will, I will have to give up playing any kind of decent solo. Indeed, I will no longer be able to accompany in church and for other vocal pieces. So. That guy apparently was really much desperate because the, the way of playing French style, Italian style, is essentially different. So um, come back to the Italian style. The Italian style is much more defined by the opera, by singing, by a long line. And you will hear that um, tonight in the um, Vivaldi Cello Concerto, for example. 
the opening bars. It's, it's much more about a long legato sound and it's completely different to when you think what you need for, for dance music. You need short articul articulated bowings and um, that guy was desperate. He said, well, it's very hard to play in church music. In the German music, that time very much um, was as, as, as well like um, cantatas, arias. It's not just about dance. I mean, you had the influence there. So you can see the kind of um, problem, like it's always, how French is it? How Italian is it? And uh, that's the problem as well for us. Um, we, how we have to perform that kind of music. And I can, in a way, I can ensure you we still have got the same problem. But you can say we got some lulis in the orchestra, and then we got some more Italian characters in the orchestra. <laughs> so, um, but of course, they have decisions to be made. Um, Maybe I could just like to demonstrate to come to some instruments in, instead of just talking about that. Um, when we recorded two years ago the overtures, our focus was in a way um, to say what, what I quoted before, that the Germans would at least adapt the rhythm. And so it means like a certain kind of pron um, pronunciation on the dance in the uh, Bach um, dance movement. And um, well, one choice, for example, is what kind of bow are we going to use? Um, is it a French bow? Is it more Italian bow? And I can show you the difference. Just to show you a little bit, just the frame to get an idea. I mean, that looks very much like a modern bow, but I mean, of course, here you have the perfect models toward um, being in the middle case. Maybe you can have a later case. So these about how they appear, they um, finally appear in states back to um, 70, 82. You can actually say that quite precisely when the finally the metal ferrule comes uh, comes here around the frog bit. And that was on request from the violinist Viotti, at that time very um, famous Italian violinist being in Paris. And he was a little bit annoyed that the hair always like changed, like when, when you play on the string, you wanted to have a, the same width of hair all the time. And that's why Tort, at the time a clockmaker actually, invented that silver ferrule. And that's then later the state as the, the about contemporary bow, it was a birth of that <coughs> modern bow. This is a copy of an earlier short, not having that fur. And so that is maybe like the earliest contrast model I have, just to show you the length difference. The weight difference as well, we're talking here about 58, 60 gram, with the lapping they get, they get up to 60, maybe that is 55 actually. And here we have a 43 gram in the hand. So, of course, and the bow always serves a purpose. Baroque music is very much more about rhetoric and articulation. It's a speak, it's a dialogue, contrapuntic style, meaning um, you have several voice, different voices, um, yeah, having a kind of dialogue in between, and therefore you need a good articulation. But then there's something in between. I mean, that bow is a quite early bow. That's a bow what the French more or less would have used. And that derives very much from when the violin was still uh, actually not a noble instrument before 1600, mainly serving dance music in bars on the street. Noble instrument at that time were viol from the viol um, time. Um, that's the elegant instrument. They had actually quite long bows in Italy, like in France. They were much more for longer lines. Just to explain you a little bit the difference, the lulis even would hold the bow like that, the hair. <laughs> the thumb under the hair. The Italians would never, wouldn't dream of that. Or very early, um, probably they've done that, but then they later, they can see reports, they would hold the bow like that. And that is more like a bow Corelli would have used. A little bit longer, a little bit more, you already get some bending in, and that is because you want to play the long lines. What these violins I just quoted had so much problem and trouble with. Um, the bow itself, um, just from the construction, maybe that might be interesting as well, is 
you might miss the screw at the end. The screw and, and the, what I got here to tighten that up, it only came in, in 1714 around. And you, in the old days, you just gave tension to the bow in, in, when they normally pulled a, um, put a string, an old string underneath here, and then that's how they gained a certain kind of tension. And when people always said, oh, the bow was always um, convex, what you see on paintings. Actually, the construction, it's not necessarily convex. There's a slight curve here in as well. A curve is always where you get some action in a bow, where it becomes lively, where, where you can speak with. It's just when that short bow, oops, I'm missing it, yeah. <laughs> um, when you give attention, it always looks, looks convex. This frock is called a, um, well, this part is called a, a frock, and the bow is called a clip frock bow. And I found it um, quite interesting when I, when I read like over the history of the bow, bow where it derives from this, like um, people saying, oh, it looks like a frock, like a sitting frock. And the other explanation was um, because the hair is fixed in here, and it sometimes happened that it just jumped off the bow and landed on the floor, and that's why it calls a frock. <laughs> So there were different um, explanations. Anyway, so we decided um, when we played, uh, when, when we recorded the uh, Bach overtures, to do it on that kind of bow. And we realized actually if the whole orchestra does that, it certainly gives a different quality to, um, to the sound. And um, we as well recorded it in a lower pitch. That's another very interesting thing in, in performance practice. Because today you can somehow quite, well, I wouldn't say standardized, but uh, very common is a pitch of 415, um, A being 415 hertz, you say hertz. Um, just to compare, it's, it's about a half tone lower than um, the normal um, chamber tone A would be. Modern orchestras today, they tend to be even higher because they want the sound to be more brilliant and a bit louder. So the higher you get, the more pressure you get on the instrument, and it's, everything is like, it's about being brilliant. The French at that time, especially, they had a very low pitch, which was about um, 392, and that's how we recorded it. So we're talking about a, a good tone lower than a modern orchestra would play today. And um, it's actually, yeah, we had to get used to that. It's completely different um, tension in the strings. They feel like first, quite floppy and um, you miss a certain tension, but it's, it's just like with everything, you get adapt to that. Um, the question, of course, like uh, was, what was the pitch in Germany at that time? What was the pitch in, in Bach's, Bach's area? And um, one influence, of course, is a string instrument. They get, can tune whatever. Um, and it's about, well, what were the instruments like? You can find the wood instruments, woodwind instruments, they're much more, uh, well, fixed in one position. And, um, and of course, the organs. And, um, and it's quite interesting because the organs at that time were quite high and um, the wood instruments low. And, and then you could see when the, uh, part, the partitur, the music itself was um, transposed and there, there you can see actually where, where the wood instrument would meet, meet the pitch of the organ in a certain re region like Weimar, Leipzig, or Köthen, where, where he served. And it's very likely that in Köthen, actually, where he probably has written these um, pieces, the pitch was at 392 hertz, and that's why we went for that. Interesting um, about the organs, actually, like Italy is always, you had a very high pitch in, in, in the earlier Baroque, about 460, even higher. And that very much often had the reason um, that it's just about costs, about money. And you can imagine building a whole organ, uh, you can save a lot of money if you just cut the pipes a little bit shorter. <laughs> <laughs> and that's basically, um, in the end, um, you can't really say it's about, well, they wanted that definitely in that um, tone. It's about like what they had, and it's very much about money. It's the same if we talk about scale of an orchestra. It's like how big should an orchestra be? And um, before preparing that talk, I just had a look. And yeah, uh, it's quite interesting. You can find out um, in which scale they played very much. And 
you see, the more money there is, the bigger the orchestra, basically. And it's about showing off in presentation and also how the orchestra sits. I mean, no orchestra would really um, choose by itself to sit symmetrically on stairs and, and in, in a row. That's very much, it looks nice. And um, yeah, it's not about <laughs> um, how easy it is to play always. Um, so, uh, I don't know, we could go on and on, but um, <laughs> I guess we'll have to see. Um, I don't want to hold you back from maybe having, uh, do you have any questions like, yes, please. Um, I, I went on the internet, oh, thanks. I went on the internet to try to uh, find out exactly what was meant by performance practice, and I wasn't really successful <laughs> at learning. Um, so yes. that's my first question. The second question is, what exactly is going to be happening tomorrow? Because the description uh, on the web was was very uh, was very short. It wasn't clear. Okay. Well, I don't know what the description was. I very much give in a way that kind of talk again because it wasn't really clear um, for me as well, like how informed you are and you're very I mean very informed it seemed to me. So I very happy that you could follow most things and. Um, Tomorrow there will be as well the orchestra be and we would play some examples for example when I mentioned these kind of lully operas there will be um, short excerpts of these as well from Kusa pieces of the dance movements and it's very much in a way that will follow that same style that's the question um, his, uh, the answer to that question and the well, other one. In, I, I would probably, I mean, I'm specialized in both. I would do probably the same. I mean, it's always, it depends on the audience. I don't know actually what I can expect, how many people will be there. And um, everybody's uh, welcome to to, um, to ask whatever he likes. And of course, since your um, whole orchestra is there, like you, there will be the wind instruments. We can talk a little bit about the wind instruments. Um, for example, I could mention that Tonight, when we play the Obo d'Amore concerto, which is maybe quite interesting, the Obo d'Amore is just an, a German invention being an, invented in 1715 in Leipzig, never been used in France, and um, was fashionable till 1730, where one, uh, two thirds of the whole repertoire was written for that instrument, and then another um, third of the repertoire was written till 1760, and then it somehow vanished more or less from from the Baroque classical program. So that's um, quite unique. Um, his, you asked as well about what is, uh, sorry, historical performance, pra performance practice. But performance practice is a very general term. What we're doing is like correctly, and I always get confused with that, and um, uh, it's about historical informed performance practice. It actually means like we try to play, to use the instruments um, from the time the music was written, like when we, I mean the normal, um, I have a Baroque violin, I have a classical violin, I have a romantic violin, and they differ as well, and the sound is quite different, and it's just, as I demonstrated, French early, Baroque bow, Corellian, Italian style, and we got a classical bow here, they're getting longer, the, the curve changes, it's actually an original, and that is Sorry, I've got a bit <laughs> space, a bit difficult. And that's finally the romantic bow. So um, we try to use the instruments of that time. And as a violinist, that's actually relatively cheap compared to a flute or oboe, because you could add every five, 10 years, you can add another, um, how you call these, um, in Germany you would call it klappe. Um, key. Key, yeah, I mean, well, it's, Originally, you just have to stop everything by your finger, and then later you use the um, metal things, oh, the, frets. the frets. Yeah, probably. So, like, it would gradually grow and 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 bassoon the same. So it's quite expensive for them actually. When we say, oh, the next product, I think we record in 423 hertz because that was actually in in Leipzig the really key. They would say, oh, <laughs> it costs us quite a lot of money. Uh, sorry, they, I think you get. Uh. I wanted to take advantage of your your being a bow maker yeah. and ask a little more about the materials because it looks like all of those bows use different woods. 
and whether that, and also the type of string that was used, whether there was much variation. Well, the, do you mean the string on these, the, the hair string, on the bow? The hair on, on the actually, bow is back in the That thing. is actually very much, I mean, horse hair. You could see old quotes, uh, and quite interesting that the Stadtpfeife, which I mentioned before, playing like, um, uh, or dance musicians, playing dance musicians at that time, they would really um, be happy to be placed um, uh, in the stable when they went to the hotel. You, ah. this, <laughs> you can really see that in, in some quotes because I could just get hold of hair. <laughs> and uh, as well, you could, um, it's not for, for a short bow they used, that wasn't too difficult because, I mean, it's, it's more difficult, like, well, they should choose the stable carefully to get that length then. <laughs> and um, so they has the same interesting question about the the wood, and I don't want to make it too long. I mean, the cheaper bows were made of um, European wood, like beech, strong wood, um, or pear, like these, and, and acacia. I don't, I don't know how you really pronounce all these different kinds of English, sorry about that. Disadvantage of these woods, relatively light to tropical wood, so you have to make them thicker to uh, gain, have a certain weight, but then you lose flexibility. From early on, like 16th, um, 16th century, you would have tropical wood coming to Europe already. And for Baroque, it established that being a snake wood coming from Suriname, being very, very good, quite strong, can make it very light. It's a little disadvantage to the what Tort established as the perfect wood later, Pernambuco, coming from Brazil. It's, slightly too heavy for that, because if you build the bow longer, then it gets top heavy. So that means like mm, you really have to work a little bit. Pernambuco, which these two bows are made of, and actually this one as well, they come in a different color as well. And that depends how they oiled and, and aged. Um, Pernambuco has the perfect, uh, it's a perfect balance between all these, because it got the flexibility, it's very quick in response, so you can make it thin. And it, it's not too heavy, and um, it's just perfect. So for the modern use, for the Baroque, well, it's just, it's also um, the instrument. You will find out the bow is 50% of the sound, and, and you can change a lot of sound um, using a different bow on your instrument. Please. I believe uh, one of your next uh, performance venues is the Disney Concert Hall. And I'm wondering, are, are there ways to um, adjust the performance, especially for your orchestra in different venues, such as Coolidge or Disney or a church? And you know, what it would be your ideal setting for a concert? That's a very, very good question. but. Um, it's very hard to answer. I mean, we um, just before the talk, we had an hour trying out the acoustic, and actually for us it was a quite stressful day because we played yesterday in Jackson. We played in a church with a carpet. <laughs> then we left quite early, all of the bit <laughs> getting through, and, but then um, coming to this acoustic and no people in there. And that's also very interesting. You practice and think, oh, it sounds very over acoustic, so we should really hold back. Um, and you will notice maybe, um, especially in an empty room, the higher strings, or the, the high free voices, they overpower the rest. And, and then later when you've got people sitting there, you realize it's completely the opposite. And you can only get an idea. And um, the talking about the Disney Hall, which apparently is very, very big. And um, of course, I mean, um, a Baroque orchestra is not meant to play in these occasions, but then as well, they went to an extreme when you, when you think like the celebration in England, you have um, what they're planning now, probably um, when the 60th anniversary of the Queen in England is, they're going to perform the water music, I think, on a boat on the Thames. That's how, <laughs> how it originally was. And um, you get lots of people together and you can play as loud as you want. Um, you might hear the trumpets in the end. No? <laughs> and then when the wind comes as well, so it blows everything in a different direction. So probably the queen may, might not hear anything, but then the people in the pub on, on the side there will, might hear. Have you been to Disney at Disney? No, I haven't been. No, no, we, we're very um, looking forward to that. 
There is sometimes in general, I mean, in modern concert halls, when we played in Japan, these huge concert halls in, in Tokyo, five, six thousand people, and you think, wow, that sounds really perfect. And then um, finally you realize, and you don't see it, these big halls, sometimes they got a sound adjustment. That doesn't mean um, it's 100% arti it's arti artificial, but it's so well done that you microphone somewhere um, 15 meters on, uh, high up under the ceiling and, and speakers you won't see, but it's a perfect sound. So actually it is, and I had that experience once when we played in a German um, old original theater in, in a court like dating 1700, and we thought, brilliant acoustic, yeah, unbelievable. So much wood, no real reflection. I mean, wood meaning like um, construction, like in, 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 uh, um, in the scene, in the backs, and that doesn't really give a good response. And that was the same. So you see, oh, well, they had some microphones there somewhere. So I think here yes, it, it is pure sound, but also that's a special acoustic as well. And in, in a church which is just made out of stone and that kind of echo, quite different as well. I mean, when you hear what they've done in, 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 in Venice, San Marco is supposed to be that six seconds long echo. They must have lived with that, must have liked it. and. You could maybe then sometimes we ask, well, actually, should we play a little bit slower that you understand anything? <laughs> and um, so you have to adapt to these places. So I don't know if there aren't more questions. I think anyway, it's get running a little bit late already. And, and I think this concert started at 8. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Oh, by the way, because since you're here, I can just um, one one word that that didn't make our tour very easy. Our concert master actually didn't get hold of his visa, and I mean we had the date at the same time. I got mine two weeks later, and he's still waiting. Like, and that's quite a while ago for his visa, so he's not here. Big change for us, of course. I mean, since we don't play with conductor director, so. Um, Luckily, a colleague from the first violin, Shiharu Abi, jumped in to be concertmaster, but we not able to play the fourth Brandenburg. I'm very sorry about that, but it requires a big violin solo and um, with no rehearsals and no show, uh, no notice, of course, in these cases, because we were hoping till till the end. Well, it should arrive, but it didn't arrive. Instead, we're going to play um, Telemann, which actually is a very interesting and nice piece, and um, it's for traverse flute and flute, Habeck, I don't know what we call that. And um, since we talked about Italian and French influence, here we got a Polish influence as well in the last movement. That's the last movement which will end the concert and the Polish uh, influence in that case is actually quite rustic and lively and quite fun to listen, just a different component. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.